Uh, my name is Joel. Um, I'm a I'm from the U.S. Uh, I did my work at Columbia. Um, I mostly work with Bengali uh, materials, but um, also some with uh, with Sanskrit, particularly as of late, um, and uh, a little bit in Tibetan as well, uh, a smidge of Hindi here and there. But uh, most of what we'll be dealing with um, today, at least in the first half of the talk, um, is drawn from uh, Sanskrit texts and um, and then towards the end, there's some uh, from Bengali and from uh, some ethnographic field work um, that I did uh, in uh, in Bengal. Um, so yeah, so uh, I guess the um, the only, the only other preliminaries that I should say is uh, is I want to thank the um, IAS for uh, for hosting me and for hosting this, and thank all of you um, for um, for coming. I certainly appreciate your interest. Uh, especially in such uh, esoteric uh, materials. Um, and then uh, the last caveat uh, or uh, comment is that um, I should say this is a, still a work in progress. I'm here for another few months. Um, and uh, there are still texts that I'm trying to track down and read. There are still commentaries uh, that I'm reading um, and others that I'm trying to find. Um, there's more field work, certainly. Um, to be done on this. This is the this is the beginning of a, of a project rather um, than the end of it. So, um, having said all that, um, I'd like to uh, to ask you to. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start with a story, and so what I what I want you to do um, is to to think of a sage. Um, assuming that I can figure out how to. There we go. Um, and not just any sage, but we're talking about uh, Vishistha. He's one of the seven uh, sages who are uh, believed to have revealed the Vedas in India. Um, this guy is basically immortal. He is many thousands of years old um, and incredibly wise and knowledgeable. Um, he knows how to do yoga. He knows how to do meditation. He knows how to recite mantras and get uh, you know boons and, and various things uh, from deities in the process. Um, but what we find uh, in some of the, the texts that I'm looking at, and this is the sort of uh, the main uh, narrative conceit that I, that I want us to think about today, um, is a story wherein uh, Vishistha is meditating on the goddess Tara. Um, and in most all these cases, he's doing this somewhere out in the east of India. Um, so he's up on a mountain somewhere um, in, uh, in what's now Assam or, or thereabouts. He's meditating on the goddess Tara and he has he discovers after thousands of years that he has no success. And so uh, Vishistha happens to be the son, they're directly the son of the creator God, uh, Brahma Deva. So he goes to Brahma in this, uh, in this version. This is, uh, there are various versions of the story. This is from the, the um, Chinachara Tantra, um, more or less. Uh, so he goes to Brahma and says, you know, I'm not having any success. Something is weird, I don't understand it. Brahma says, go back and, and just, do, do it some more, maybe it just takes longer. So he goes back and he meditates again for another thousand years or so, still trying to have um, a vision of the goddess Tara um, and attain the, uh, the various uh, benefits that come along with that. And he has no success still. So, you know, he gets mad and when sages get mad, bad things happen. So he begins to curse the goddess. He takes a little sip of water, which is what um, these kinds of sages would do before uttering a curse. Um, which would effectively, um, you know, make her uh, impotent in the world. And just as he's about to do that, the goddess appears. And she says, uh, look, you know, you have a, a one very small problem um, that you have not taken account of, which is that there's only one person on the, in the world who knows how to do uh, my practice properly, and you have to go to visit this person. And this person is the Buddha, and you will find him in... Mahachina, so greater China. We'll spend some time trying to figure out what that means. Um, she says you have to go to China, so to speak, and find the Buddha, and uh, he'll explain it to you. So, uh, you know, Vishistha says, okay, fine. And, um, you know, he makes the, the long schlep across the Himalayas to uh, greater China. Um, which is uh, situated somewhere beside the Himalayas, this text tells us. Um, and having done so, he finds the Buddha. But what he finds is not what he expects to find. Um, he finds the Buddha basically in the middle 
of a party. Um, the Buddha is, uh, he's drinking wine. Um, he says his eyes are red. Uh, he's surrounded by a thousand women who are dancing and frolicking uh, in sexy clothes. Um, and everyone is shameless. Uh, and they're doing this at the same time as they're meditating on the goddess. Now, Vishishta is naturally um, quite scandalized by this. And uh, he immediately objects. Um, and he says that this is opposed to what's in the Veda. He tells the Buddha that this is opposed to what's in the Veda. Um, at which point a voice comes down from the sky and, and informs Vishishta. It says, you know, don't think about it this way. This is just how it is that you have to worship Tara. Um, if you do this with the, the Chinese method, this china chara, the china krama, sometimes, um, then you will you'll get uh, success in worship of Tara. So, uh, you know, Vishista agrees. You know, he's somewhat reluctantly, but he he goes along with it, um, and he says, "All right, so tell me how this works." So uh, here from the Nila Tantra, because it's a little more concise, um, is uh, is in some ways what pe the the gist. Uh, of of what this practice, this post Chinese practice, is supposed to entail, um, which, as you'll see here, um, seems to be uh, primarily that there are no rules really, um, no rules for time restraint. That is to say, what days or what times of the month um, in, in which you could practice, or under which astrological uh, configurations. Um, no obligatory rites um, that you know things that you would have to worship uh, on particular regular basises. Uh, daily or, and whatnot. Um, essentially, uh, the text, uh, the Nila Tantra here says, um, the rules are as one wishes, and there's nothing unlawful whatsoever. Anything could be great dharma. So this is basically you, you do as you like. I mean, you have to do a puja, um, but you you don't have to follow any of the normal rules that you, know, you would expect to find in the context of uh, Hindu uh, uh, ritual worship all the various purifications and things like that. Um, so uh, Vishista uh, in, this, uh, in this text, or in these texts in general, um, he returns to India. Um, and having done so, he practices uh, this uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, he has success, uh, success in worshiping uh, Tara in so doing. Um, now, this is interesting because this is only one of just a small handful of cases where we can see an obvious uh, import uh, of a practice um, from Buddhism to Hinduism. Now, it's interesting on its own, but the bigger question I want us to think about is why does Vishista have to go to China to do this? What is the Buddha doing in China anyway, right? Isn't the Buddha supposed to be Indian or Nepali, right? Um, and, and why or since when or in what contexts does this goddess Tara require this Chinese style of worship, right? If informed uh, viewers among you will reasonably ask, well, wasn't the goddess Tara, isn't she originally Indian as well? Um, and then lastly, you know, what if anything is Chinese about this Chinese method, um, which claims to be in many ways no method at all? Um, how different is it from standard Indian practices of goddess worship? And what kind of relationship are we imagining between Hinduism and Buddhism anyway, um, when we think about it in these terms? That is to say, don't they already share lots and lots of different um, deities and traditions? So when we look at this goddess, and that's uh, the particular focus here, goes by um, you know, four different names or so. Um, I've given you images, uh, one from Tibet, one from Nepal, one from India, from slightly different time periods. Um, you can see iconographically, they're basically the same. We'll dig into the iconography a little bit uh, more as we go. Um, but it, this is to, to raise the issue in many ways of the relationship between Buddhism and Hinduism um, as construed uh, in these texts. Okay, so um, if we're thinking about the relationship between these two traditions though, uh, you know, we have to admit from the front um, that there are lots and lots of shared deities between the two traditions. Right, so I have an image here from Japan. You can see Saraswati, Ganesha, and Kubera, these uh, Hindu gods. Um, as far away as Japan, these, a lot of these deities are immediately imported um, into the Buddhist tradition. Um, we also have uh, among the 
the avatars, these uh, incarnations of the god Vishnu, um, starting from about the 8th century or so. Um, there are the Buddha, you can see there. I don't know if you can see the cursor, but um, um, on the, uh, the bottom row, second from the right, uh, the Buddha is supposed to be the ninth avatar of Vishnu. Um, so in some of these texts, actually, uh, they're very explicit to say that it's the uh, Buddha avatar of Vishnu that Vishishta finds out in China, which is even stranger in a way, because then you have an avatar of a Hindu god. What's he even doing outside of India? Um, but uh, to continue here, we have... Uh, Examples of things running the opposite direction, among which we find Tara. This is a, a group of 10 Mahavidyas, um, that is to say wisdom goddesses. A Vidya is also uh, a name for a, um, a mantra uh, for a goddess. Um, so among these goddesses, we can point out at least two of them who are pretty clearly imports from Buddhism into Hinduism. So going back the other direction. And this is more what we're looking at today. The two of these, are, by the way, are Tara, the second one, um, and Chinamasta, uh, the sixth one down there, the first one, that's the second uh, row. Okay, uh, but uh, let's let's uh, slow down for a moment here, um, because uh, if you're not familiar with this uh, Mahavidya tradition, which you might reasonably not be, because they're, it's esoteric, um, and the iconography might be unfamiliar, let's quickly just point out that the reason for this is because these are tantric traditions, that is to say, um, they are initiatory uh, traditions to which you don't get access without going through a particular kind of ritual initiation generally, and, and the forms of practice that are based on them. So the tantras are a genre of text, which includes also agamas, nigamas, yamas, various other texts, samhitas, um, by that name, but broadly construed uh, a particular sort of mode of, of practicing religion based on these, uh, these texts. Happens to be quite mainstream. A lot of Hindu temple ritual, as we now know it, is based on these texts. So it's nothing, you know, um, that's really too far out of what uh, people would normally encounter. These traditions uh, typically use um, sacred sounds, linguistic mysticism, and things like that, the mantras, uh, these various diagrams, geometric representations uh, called yantras, or and uh, and a variety of hand gestures, uh, forms of visualization. Um, and meditation, yoga, things like that, in order to accomplish uh, what they're doing. Often visualizing oneself as a deity, in fact. Um, so here's where it gets uh, a little bit more controversial. Um, in some places, uh, tantric worship may involve offerings that are normally considered impure, according to Hindu um, and uh, according to Buddhist uh, ritual purity as well. So these things would include uh, animal sacrifice, um, and alcohol, um, most prominently. And then in some very limited contexts, um, there are certain advanced, you know, some uh, really rarefied practices that uh, either directly or symbolically may engage with um, human mortality or sexuality. This is practices that may take place in the cremation grounds. A lot of this Chinese, so-called Chinese practice is stipulated that it should occur um, in desolate places, among which cremation grounds are, are quite proper, um, and uh, sexuality. So, um, you know, one, one thing to, uh, to mention here when we're thinking about these um, is that, in fact, this, this tantric area is an area where we see a lot of the most uh, obvious back and forth between Buddhist and Hindu deities. Um, you know, it's been shown in, uh, by Alexis Anderson and others that uh, a lot of what Buddhist Tantra seems to entail at certain points is taking Hindu Tantric texts and just sort of doing find inner place. So where it says Shiva, they put in Buddha. And so we see some of the same kinds of things um, today uh, in the context of uh, looking at Tara. So here's also a Chinamunda, Chinamasta, um, the other deity in this form that is also typically worshipped uh, with Chinachara. You can distinguish these two quite easily in some ways because the Buddhist one there on the left um, has Shiva directly under uh, Shiva and uh, Parvati under her feet. So, you know, a lot of times this sort of shared traditions, it's not always um, extremely um, uh, nice. Sometimes it's a little bit more sort of appropriative or even um, agonistic. 
Okay, but even with all that, we find this goddesses like Chinamasta and Tara, um, despite these features uh, sometimes, um, incorporated into this group of the Mahavidyas and for, uh, formulated as manifestations of major Indian goddesses like Durga, Kali, and Tripura Sundri. This, this uh, yantra here, this uh, Sri Yantra on the, in the image on the right is a representation um, of that goddess. Um, so, uh, and I should point out that Tara is never really in this position um, as being shown as the sort of primary deity and all the others are manifestations of her. Um, one thing I will point out here is that, you know, Tara's conversion is somewhat incomplete, somewhat, uh, so to say, iconographically. If you look at the image on the far left, you can see Tara at one o'clock and she's standing on what is plainly just a corpse sort of on a stretcher that's wrapped in a cloth. Whereas if you look at the second image, uh, on the one in the middle, that is to say, um, there is uh, Tara represented there um, just at, at about you know 10 o'clock or so. And she's standing on a, a, an a image of Shiva instead of just a generic corpse. So you know there's some variation with these things. When places that you don't find uh, this variation so much um, are in attempts to either sort of collapse Tara and Kali, which we'll see quite a bit, um, but you know, in the in the context of the Mahavidyas, generally speaking, there are certain features that uh, that will give away this sort of Buddhist aspect of the goddess Tara. Um, and we're going to just look at these very briefly. Some of these um, moments of uh, the sort of uh, the iconography and the the textual transmission that show um, how these traditions came to be. Okay, so here's a long quote. We're not going to read all through it necessarily, I mean, um, but uh, from the Sadhanamala, which is a um, an eleventh century probably, or at least this portion of it is eleventh century uh, Buddhist text. Uh, sadhanas are these liturgies for worshiping various deities, um, and it just collects a bunch of them. Um, so here um, we have the um, what's called the dhyana, the meditative description, which is also going to be the basis for the iconography of this. Uh, this Mahachina Tara, so the, the Tara of Greater China. Um, and you see it describes what she's holding in her hands. You have this chopper, um, which is scissors in some other places because the, the word um, means scissors in, in modern uh, Indian languages, this Kartri. Uh, she has a sword also and a, a, a skull cup and a lotus. Um, and she's standing on a corpse. Um, but the thing I want to really draw uh, your attention to here um, is this last line that she bears the image of Akshobhya within her hair. And you can see on the top here, this little, there's a snake up there. Um, so this, act, this uh, particular description, um, we see more or less quoted, I mean, they clean up the Sanskrit because the Sanskrit is sort of, uh, well, Buddhist Sanskrit. So they clean up the Sanskrit and it, and it makes its way into the uh, Fit Karani Tantra in around the 13th century or so. And from the Fitkarani Tantra, uh, it makes its way into later East Indian Shakta Tantras, uh, which are most of the sources that we're looking at today, or that I've been looking at, and various tantric compendia, these Nibandhas, um, which are very widespread in, in use in Eastern India, and then to Tara-centric uh, ritual manuals, um, like the uh, Tara Bhakti Sudharanava, which is the main uh, one that's in use at this temple um, that we'll look at later. Um, so you can see that this, the descriptions, the iconography are as one constant. The other thing would be the mantras, um, the Hindu and Buddhist versions of these goddesses um, have almost identical mantras with some small variants. Um, but uh, you know, while we're here on the text, I want to just make uh, one uh, quick point, which is to say um, that uh, a lot of the sources, earlier sources in particular, uh, secondary literature, I will refer to um, this Vashishta story and this idea of Tara coming from uh, from China or Mahachina, uh, and they'll put it in the group of texts called the Yamalas, um, particularly this, the Brahma Yamala and the Rudra Yamala. There are two problems with this. If that were the case, the, this would be much older. There are two problems with this. One is that the, the Brahma Yamala um, that has this story, it's almost certainly an interpolation, and it's a very late one at that. Um, so Shaman Hatli has done some of this, and the um, the version of the text that of the Brahmayamala um, that he uh, constructs does not have any of this material. 
Rudra Yamala has a similar issues in that it's basically an undateable hodgepodge of texts. Um, so portions of it are very old, but then it seems to get updated quite frequently. Um, so what we have here, um, it, it looks rather late, but these are the latest, um, or rather that is to say, these are the earliest times that we could sort of prove in a text or reasonably um, assume from a text that we find um, this material around sort of the Chinese Tara, the Chinese practice, um, or in the Vishishta stories, which in fact will, will come in in uh, first, as far as we can show in these uh, later East Indian Shakta Tantras. Okay, so uh, back to the iconography. Um, you know, we have, uh, this remains constant and people have to figure out what to do with it though uh, in a Hindu context because Akshobhya is one of the five uh, Dhyani Buddhas. Um, so people have to, uh, in the commentarial literature, figure out what to do with this idea of Akshobhya, of a Buddha uh, being in the crown of this goddess because that would be, that's an iconographic feature that you don't really find a lot in Hindu contexts. So, you know, how do they interpret it? Well, one common thing that you see um, is that uh, Akshobhya is another name for Shiva because it just means that he's unshakable. So they can say that's a form of Shiva, which would make sense in this context. Um, another is the that the sign of uh, Akshobhya is this snake, which can be, you know, relatively easily written off as just, you know, she has snakes for jewels and things like that anyway for... for um, so she's got her hair tied up with a snake, um, and that's that's not a, a huge deal. Um, the other thing that people will sometimes say is that Akshobhya is the rishi, is the seer who originally revealed the Tara Mantra. The standard thing would be to say um, in Hindu context that Vashishta is the rishi who, re who revealed it because you have this whole story about him. Um, but another way uh, people deal with it is to say that actually um, it, Akshobhya is the name of the rishi. Okay. so. Um, people are, the, these texts are inconsistent in dealing with this. Um, and the same is true in some ways of this so-called Chinese method. So looking across a range of texts, um, I'm just going to uh, pull out a few things that, that might be um, potentially distinctive about the texts or that people have held up at various points as being distinctive. Um, so one view is to say, actually, there's not really anything distinctive about this Chinese method at all. It's basically the same as Vamachara, or kaulachara, meaning the so-called left practices, the left-hand path, so to speak, um, in the sort of contemporary occultist parlance, or the the kaulachara, um, which is the, the the practices associated with the, the kaula tradition, a particular sort of um, the name means the sort of like the clan or the family, um, but that would also involve um, certain features that we'll see uh, in a moment. Um, before we get to that, though, I'd say there are, there's another group that says, no, it's actually really just the same as Swechachara, which is another achara. There's another method of practice, um, which is supposedly characterized by this acting according to one's own will and for certain restricted contexts and certain times. Um, so, you know, in in order to back that up, people would point out, this is the Swechachara claim in particular, this idea that there are no fixed times for worship, no obligatory or preliminary rites in some cases, uh, meaning usually there are various um, recitations of the mantra that have to be done before it becomes effective. Um, and that all the purification, the ritual purification is done through visualization instead of, you know, going and having a bath in the river, for example. Um, uh, the indifference to and or exploitation of ritual impurity. That is to say the use of um, not only things like animal sacrifice and alcohol, but um, in some cases explicitly eating while you're doing the ritual, which makes one impure, um, and offering the leftovers of your own food uh, to the goddess, um, which would be an extremely disrespectful thing to do in other contexts. But um, we find some of this kind of thing um, in Kaolachara and also uh, in uh, Chinachara. The worship of women, sometimes also involving uh, certain sexual practices, uh, would be a thing that people would point to. Again, not unique to Chinachara, um, but a, a distinct feature of it. Um, when we get to this, the, this third group here, um, these are the things that I find somewhat perhaps more convincing, which is to say that um, the Chinachara and a lot of these texts are required only for very specific deities. And the two of the deities that really stick out here are Tara and Chinamasta. Um, 
uh, you have explicit textual acknowledgement of Buddhist parallels in some of these. The Shakti Sangama Tantra, for instance, divides Chinachara into Hindu and Buddhist forms, explicitly says so. Um, and lastly, there's a curious thing where there's some prohibitions against performing Vaishnava rituals. We find that in some of these texts as well, um, which I haven't seen in, in, in a lot of other contexts. Okay, so, um, you know, a lot of these are, are inconstant, but this is a range of things that we find. Um, so, but this is, you know, kind of thin sauce, right? So why, why are we calling this Chinese at all? I think maybe possibly it accounts for some of these more obvious Buddhist elements, but then we still have to wonder why they're associated with China. Um, and the, the Buddhist version of this goddess, the Buddhist version of this Mahachina Tara is not worshiped with any kind of Chinachara. They don't really talk about that. Um, for instance, she does not receive um, some of these more impure offerings. Okay, but where even is this China? So we have a question about this. It could be somewhere in the sort of broader area of Kamarupa. Um, so the seventh, ninth century or so, there was a, this is more or less a unified political formation that would include uh, parts of Nepal, parts of Bhutan, um, parts of the Himalayas over there. Um, and this is where a lot of these texts that we were dealing with were actually written. So, um, you know, that's one possibility. Um, the, uh, the other things that we might think about here um, also is that this part of the country is sort of the land of, um, the, the China is supposedly in, stated in some of these contexts to be not only is it a Buddhist country, but it's a country where the people practice the Atharva Veda. So, which is kind of a magical, it's a land of magic and mystery. Um, and that's consistent with some views that we find about what goes on out east. Um, so alternately, you know, um, in different texts, this uh, Ma China refers to different parts of what might, we might think of as the broader Tibetan cultural area. Could be Mount Wutai, which Nepali Buddhists associate with this Ma China idea. Could be Chinese Turkestan, that is to say Xinjiang province or the area around Mount Kailash. It could be synonymous, China and Maha China in some cases. Um, but, you know, one thing that we, we do have is that uh, the Tibetan and Chinese versions of this goddess just translate the Sanskrit name. There's no local name. So she's probably not a patron of a particular local place. There's no promotion of pilgrimage to Mahachina and things like that. But we do know Indians are going back and forth from this Tibetan area starting in the eighth century or so. Uh, certain Buddhist practices were brought back. Um, people traveled from Nepal and East India um, pretty consistently. Um, there's a precedent for this in the Garjana who goes uh, to the land of the Nagas to bring back the Mahayana scriptures. Um, and indeed, um, going back to the Southern Amala, there's a, a liturgy of Ekajata, uh, which is the same goddess for more or less, um, where the colophon says it's recovered from Bhota by Nagarjuna. Bhota, usually people think means Tibet, could also be Bhutan or something like that. Um, so this is possibly a, a textual um, relic of that. So there's a, other things like the Chur ritual um, brought in. People usually think this is the only practice that spread from Tibet to India. Okay, so very quickly, what, why do I think, um, what do I think is the kind of the real idea uh, behind this Chinachara? The main thing I think here is that um, the, this is happening, this incorporation of Tara into the Mahavidyas is happening just around the same time um, as the, as Buddhism is starting to decline uh, in India. So um, and this takes a while, it doesn't happen automatically. In fact, we see this throughout the 15th century, especially out East. Um, but this is, um, it is shortly after this time, the 16th century or so, when we start to see the Vishistha story really take, uh, come into its own. And by this point, most Indians would only have really encountered Buddhists at the extreme borders of the country or in, as pilgrims. So remember, you know, Vishistha was this uber Brahmin, right? So this, the Mahachina narrative um, is one that happens around the same time, um, that is the 16th century, 15th maybe, um, that the Hinduization of Tara gets really going in earnest. So looking back at these things that are distinctive, I've highlighted some of these now in red or made some emendations. Um, over, over time, basically, these features sort of get whittled away. So what we have are these obligatory rights, they come back in. The preliminary rights, they come back in. Particular timings and things like this are now going to be um, part of the picture again. Um, the list of goddesses that um, must be uh, propitiated 
with the Chinachara now begins to include Kali and things like that. So this is a this is a way that you know we can see that um, this Hinduization process um, is concurrent with the rise of uh, essentially of the absence of large scale Buddhism in India. Uh, we see a development of an eight Tara scheme. Um, which is a thing that happens with the goddesses like Lakshmi in Hindu contexts, not based on the Buddhist systems of 21 Taras at all. Um, and stories where Vishishta comes back into India to found various Tara temples. Um, but my favorite of these, of course, uh, is one that's well known now in West Bengal in Tarapit. So very quickly, you can see it's, it's a major pilgrimage hub now. Um, the station has the form of the temple. Um, if you have the stairs going up, they have the Mahavidyas along the stairs. It really leans into this kind of um, Mahavidya narrative. And it leans also um, into a secret narrative that does tend to involve uh, Vishishta. So you have a public image, which you can see here on the left. And there's a private image, which is the so-called real image at the temple, um, which is based on, uh, which is a, a stone image that's supposed to have occurred when uh, Vishishta got a vision of Tara. The, the story is that he comes from uh, Mahachina and comes to Bengal and uh, does his meditation there uh, doing this Chinese practice in their cremation grounds by this temple. And so you have a, this Tara image where she's nursing Shiva is a, an iconographic form that's sort of spawned out of, from what I can tell, um, this uh, stone image, uh, which I could not photograph. Similarly, at the, in the cremation ground itself, you can see on the right, there are these stone, quote unquote, footprints that Tara is supposed to have left when she appeared to Vishishta there. Um, and so a, kind of a, a replica of those that you can find in the temple. So if you look in the pilgrimage literature there, um, one thing that happens is people really kind of lean into this idea that Vishishta and Nagarjuna kind of do the same things. Um, so in this text, you know, they refer even to Nagarjuna as the, as the Buddhist Vishishta. Um, so this idea of going to China or Tibet and bringing back practices related to Tara. Um, in contemporary uh, Tara Pit, anyway, this is something that's a good thing that people sort of are, are more interested in thinking about. Um, similarly, you know, in many ways, the, the, the fame of the area is based around um, this uh, a saint who lives in the cremation ground in Bamakapa, a 19th century saint. What we also find then are a number of stories around him that either have him going to uh, to Tibet or, and bringing back practices or his disciples bringing back things for him, images of the goddess and so on. Uh, sometimes the stories of the feet are related to him. So this narrative of travel and bringing back practices from China or Tibet, um, you know, takes on a kind of a, a life of its own. All right, um, last, last uh, points here. Um, in the 19th century, this narrative has another use though. Um, and the, the narrative, the, the thing that it can be used for among some reformers, including Swami Vivekananda, um, is to basically blame whatever people don't like about the tantric practices um, on the Buddhists. Okay, um, Tibetan and other barbarous customs um, and saying that these, are, these aren't Hindu practices at all, so we can justifiably get rid of them. You know, a little later, just a little bit later, this is 1914, um, you know, we find uh, an indication that this is still kind of the, the dominant view amongst um, the intelligentsia, but uh, there's a turn kind of against it because there's a rehabilitation of Tantra that's happening in some ways. Um, this, is a, this is from a review of a book by um, Arthur Avalon. We can talk about that a bit in the um, Q&A if you want. Um, but the, that basically says, you know, uh, it makes a lot of the same arguments that the um, the infamous sort of aspects of tantric ritual, the sexual rituals and stuff, are actually that's Chinese or Tibetan or something. Um, but you know, that it wants to rehabilitate the project of, of tantra in general by being able to push some of those things to the side. Now, the problem with that, if we move forward a little bit to the modern day, is that Tibet is not a really an appealing target anymore. Tibetan Buddhism is hip. Um, and it has, if anything, um, a sort of a, a little bit of a, some mysterious occult cachet um, in India. Um, so there's kind of like an Indiana Jones movie where they have Tibetan uh, clues, which is sort of gibberish Tibetan, but um, this is a, a way that in fact, it becomes a point of pride for people in the materials around uh, Tarapit and contemporary 
um, the pilgrimage literature or if you do ethnography, um, people are, are actually very interested in making these links um, to Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism. Okay, so, um, you know, even though this is a point of pride now, people tend to, uh, to want to, uh, to really um, bring these things forward, possibly because of their um, interactions with people in the, in the um, borderlands, in the mountainous borderlands, where the middle classes might go for um, holidays and things like that, partially maybe because of Tibetan um, global cachet or the, the experiences with Tibetan refugees in India. Um, this, there's a lot more of this kind of thing now where it's considered a good thing, but at the same time, um, Tali and Tara are, are merged ever more and more closely. So this Chinachara narrative really kind of falls to the side. It's still there. It's still useful in some ways as a, a way to introduce novel uh, traditions or traditions where you don't have a known lineage. You can just say, I got it from some Baba Ji who went to the Himalayas, some saint. Um, but in fact, it's, uh, it's now it's much more um, something that just sort of happens behind the scenes, which is supposed to be secret and secretive anyway. Um, but uh, eff effectively, what we have is that this Mahachina Tara, um, even though this is the dominant Hindu form of Tara, uh, is now basically just Tara, and Tara becomes more or less just Kali. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave you uh, with you there, and um, look forward to your questions. <laughs>